and welcome. We're all here. Hello, my name is Hilary McNevin. Welcome to the second Worksmith Community Series Conversations. On behalf of Worksmith and Turnip Media, of which I'm a founder, I'd like to say welcome to this really inter interesting discussion. And I also want to acknowledge our other sponsors who are basically supporting Worksmith beautifully with all, all the work they're giving us. And that's um, Mercedes-Benz Vans, ALM, Zero, Kookaburra and Square. So with that, welcome again, and let's get into this great discussion. Tonight we're talking born out of lockdown. February last year, and then into March 2020, we all know our world changed significantly. It had already started changing overseas, and then Australia was hit with the lockdown from COVID. Now, every, so many different stories have come out of it, and tonight we're lucky to talk to three people who've actually built businesses from then on, and I can't wait to hear their stories. Please welcome Gareth Whitten from Tarts and On, Audrey Allard from Holy Sugar, and Andrea Vignali from Al Dente. Welcome, guys. How are you all? Thank you for having me. Good. good. Great. Yeah. Okay, look, let's start because I've got lots of beautiful minds here and lots of conversation to have. Audrey, could you start, please? And just let us tell us a bit about who you are and Holy Sugar. So, um, I'm a pastry chef that has a bit of fine dine, bakery, patisserie background. I started Holy Sugar last year. Um, it's a dessert box that comes out every Tuesday. Order start Tuesday, a photo of the box is posted Tuesday or through Instagram. And um, the box is either pick up on Saturday from Worksmith or delivery. Uh -huh. so so it you, should also say you have a strong connection to Worksmith, as do you, Gareth. So, Gareth, tell us, give us a brief outline of who you are and what you do, and then we'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm uh, I'm a chef of 15 years. Um, yeah, last year during, I guess, lockdown, before, uh, yeah, we had the chance to sort of open up again. I was, I got made redundant from my job and, pretty much waiting for something to come along. And in the meanwhile, just started doing a bit of baking at home. Uh, eventually turned into, along with the pressure from my fiance into turning into something else. We uh, started selling to people in our apartment building, which kind of snowballed. Uh, we moved into Worksmith to use the kitchen space yeah. in around about December of last year. Um, and up until uh just this weekend, in fact, where we um, did our last pickup um, from the Collingwood workspace. So, yeah, we, we essentially just make um, tarts, big 25 centimetre tarts. You can pick up a whole one, a half one. They're all baked. There's no real frills to it. It's very unassuming, uh, wholesome type bakery, but we try and apply, you know, my background, which has been entirely in top end fine dining yeah. uh, to kind of make it stand out a little bit more from the norm. Um, and hopefully we're doing that. I've seen the queues yeah. well, for both of you outside Worksmith. So I think you are doing that. Andrea, That's welcome. So. And uh, tell us a bit about, well, tell us about Al Dente. So um, Al Dente started uh, during lockdown last year, obviously. And um, so at the start was a bit different because I didn't, um, like I didn't know what to do and I didn't have the job and I couldn't really um, work for anyone else, not even for myself at the moment. Yeah. So um, let's say Kookaburra gave me a chance to start selling pasta from home and started just with a really, really uh, small menu. And I never thought I was gonna get um, a restaurant, but uh, let's say before they have this one where I am now, I have probably three or four different spaces where we started working. And um, yeah, we were delivering pasta during the numerous lock lockdowns. Yeah. And um, now we're here. So yeah, uh, we got our- in different bricks and mortar yeah, so, places so just as an outlet? We, we started, it was a bit complicated because we started from my house at the start. Yeah. And after I got a pub in the city, yeah. uh, Cooper, Cooper's Inn, which yeah. is a really huge pub. And we did all the second lockdown in here, in there. And uh, at the moment we were having um, something like 350 orders a week uh, for big families. So we had 15 to 20 staff employed. Yeah. And uh, 
and yeah and but when the, um, it was a bit tricky because we were getting kitchens yes. just when the big kitchens were empty because we were in lockdown mm. so when when the lockdown was were finishing um we didn't have space so we we're going back to my house in Hollywood and prepping in a really small space we couldn't make everyone happy because we just had a little room and and uh, three wow. fridges oh wow that's yeah. extraordinary Audrey, can we go back to you for a minute? Your, you said your, your chefing background, was it pastry chef work? Yeah, pastry chef um, from bakery, like sourdoughs to pastries, mm -hmm. um, even fine dine and just normal restaurant um, background. All so in pastry. What was the first spark? Was Did you start Holy Sugar at home like these guys or was it Worksmith straight away? I started Holy Sugar at home. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think I was doing it at home for a couple of months. And then I went into Worksmith and um, started using it for three days. Mm. Uh, I think I was only in there for five hours each day or something. And then um, eventually I kind of became the, I got the pick of the crop. So I got to choose exactly like how many hours and what days I could work. I was the one left standing. So um yeah, no, I have it Fridays and Saturdays, like full days. When you say one left standing because other people had moved out of the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, there was like a little bit of like people coming in, doing a few things and like leaving. And so I kind of had to work around everyone. Yep. Um, and then eventually I got to choose my days, which was life life changing. So it's almost like each of you, I could just talk to you all for hours individually. Gareth, with that, I'm going to come back to you, Audrey, with this question too. Gareth, what was it about tarts? That made you because oh. you've got beautiful experience mm -hmm. and exp you know in fine dining venues and you'd understand you know so there'd be so many layers of cooking that you understand and technique was it you or Catherine your partner who went let's do tarts oh I just I was just baking at home yeah. I, it's it's uh, I don't know it's a kind of a medium that I've had an affinity with a long time. Yeah. Um, I I think what really kind of ignited my my love for the tart, uh, I guess, was um, when I was working um, at Dinner by Heston in London, we ran a lunch menu on weekdays. And usually it was like a lot of, as a lot of lunch menus are in European restaurants, um, that they, you know, is this sort of a set price, yep. a little bit cheaper than what the a la carte options are. Yes. It was uh, usually things were dialed down a little bit and not as perhaps refined as what they would be on the evening menu, for example. Um, uh, so one of the things that we did was a baked custard tart. It's like a shrewsbury tart with like a jam or a paste underneath a date and uh, oh, sorry, prune and tamarind. There was a gooseberry and sautern with, you know, scented custard. So, and when I, when this first came on the menu, I was a little bit taken aback and sort of like, is this, this isn't two star. This isn't like um, what I was really coming to work in Michelin restaurants in Europe for. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think over time, I just, I, I became obsessed. I like the, the little intricacies and subtle techniques and applications thereof, um, which could transform it in, from the most like humble thing that you could expect to, fine in any old bakery or, or whatever mm -hmm. um, to something that really was quite astounding. And the fact that they were baked fresh for that service and that service alone, mm -hmm. um, the care that was taken into that um, was, yeah, that was, that was what really ignited that passion for me. And I, when I came back and started doing a little bit of baking at home, that was like the first thing I went to was baking those tarts. Yeah, okay. it was really fun. You were baking other things, but the tarts were an anchor. I was making bread, but, you know, making some crumpets. It was all just like whatever was going, you know, yep. we had a sourdough start. It was a bit of fun in lockdown, but yeah, the tarts were something that was, I felt like I put a little bit more of a personality into. Um, and Kat loved them. She thought they were brilliant. My partner, should I say. And um, yeah, there were enough, they were different enough, I think, to what a lot of other people really did yes. um, in regards to like a focused item. Um that we thought we may have cornered a niche here. And um, yeah, kind of feel like we almost have, which is good. It's grown extraordinarily. I'd, we'll talk about numbers and things soon, but also then Andrea, tell us about, yes, you're Italian. Yes, you worked at Grossi and yes, pasta, but was it 
something that you needed to connect to? Why, why Pasta and then in lockdown? Was that was it a more of an emotional decision or a logical decision or both? So not really logical at all. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say at the start, I just started doing, uh, I remember I had a bit of pasta dough left over from when we were closing the restaurant. So I started from there. I also did a, a, a Concord jam and uh, I'm still using it actually uh, yeah. in, in the restaurant La Car uh, from the first lockdown. I did a lot of it. And um, yeah, but at the start for us, uh, for me, it started more like a feeding. I remember the first time I was giving food to friends and, and uh, you know, I was just cooking all day because I couldn't really stand still. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a background of uh, uh, two uh, mission stars in Italy and uh, I worked for a guy for six years. I always been in big kitchens and the type of food I was doing was different. I never been just, you know, um, making uh, 30 kilos of gnocchi in one day. No. Um, it was just a different type of cooking than the one I was used to. And um, yeah, so started from the really basics. I went back to things I also didn't do in years like lasagna or, mm. or and start questioning like why we do it like that. And, and from there we went back to um, doing new recipes on the simple pasta. So yeah. the cacio e pepe is a kind of um, a joke at the start. We just thought, you know, why we can do it different from the normal cacio e pepe, make the filling, the sauce inside. Yes. It started as a joke and now we do um, big production of it, something like 60, 70 kilos of filling a week. And um, yeah, and uh, we're trying also uh, to do a bit of that fine dining experience, experience for people at home, following mm -hmm. our instructions. But on top of that, the best part is the fact, uh, starting from these uh, simple things, yes. we arrive to put enough money on the side to have our restaurant where we try to be fine dining. So we call it approachable fine dining, but yeah, let's say we we do some some tricky um, games on dishes and and we try to be a bit different too. So. Beautiful. I think it's um, and Audrey. I think this is I find it quite inspiring what you do and what, what all of what you've done is inspiring. And Gareth, you have a big day that you've had today that you need to share with us in a moment. But Audrey, you're still you're working on your own. You and I have talked about being people who work solo a lot. Why have you? Is that a choice by you? Could you expand your team, and do you want to? Um, it's definitely a choice, and I feel like I'm just I haven't been ready to take someone on. Um, I'm a bit of a perfectionist in the sense that when I work with other people, I get a bit anxious, and I think that oh, I think I need to get someone on, but I'm just not ready for it yet. I think that I'm just going to keep doing it by myself mm. and then maybe have more of a like boundary, like say no more often and um, yeah, put myself first before I just overdo it a bit too much. Yeah. I think if we go back to the emotional connection that you have with your work as well, exactly what Gareth and Andrea were saying, there's clearly some if I can even put it in these kind of layers, lockdown was emotional anyway, it was difficult anyway. And when you start something that's very much yours, everyone's, what they're doing is created very much from here. Mm. Is it hard? Um, what firstly sparked you to do the desserts that you do and how do you choose them? And is, and is it hard to then share that with another staff member? Um, everything, I just, I get inspired by the produce that's out, I don't know. I just, I love what I do. So I just mm. want to cre keep creating. And for some reason I keep having new boxes each week. I don't know where I get the energy from to come up with them, but they just pop into my head. Um, Can you talk us through today's box? Cause I'm lucky enough to know I'm getting yeah. ordered one for this Saturday and there's five different cakes, five different, five different. Um, yeah. So there's, there's the strawberry passion fruit sponge cake yeah. and there's a, um almond frangipan based tart that's got rhubarb apple center and then a crumble on top and then I've got a baked lemon meringue tart slice and then I've got um a blueberry custard flan tart and a tiramisu cake which also has Stella coffee um through the center that's um our wonderful works with her working person who's coordinating tonight's talk Tim Varney with Stella coffee he won't mind me saying that. So if you could just tell us what, what inspired those, like where did they come from? Is it 
a matter of weeks or this morning you went or yesterday, this is what I'm doing? Um, it was basically two days before I made the box. I just, I knew I wanted to do something that my dad would want to eat because it was Father's Day weekend. Oh, okay. so there are edible flowers this week, even though I love putting them on my boxes. Yeah. Um, not that it's not a man thing. I'm totally for it. My dad's just not. Yeah. <laughs> um I don't know I just wanted something like really rich looking and I just came up with that so yeah different textures I don't know just I don't know I don't know where it comes from (laughs) but you obviously enjoyed it Gareth where do your ideas come from in terms of just yeah just different weeks I have been at Worksmith on a Sunday and seen the cues for what you Mm. do and um where, what inspires the decisions you make each week? Oh, we've only got a, I mean, there's there's just, a, there's a bit of a repertoire that we kind of try and go through where, um, uh, yeah, I think a lot of our core classics that we, I mean, say classics, but the ones that we really rely on, um, a lot of them have been inspired by where I've worked in the past. Yeah. Um, some of them are, they are pretty like basic in, in the ways that their flavor profile is. Um, but it's more about, I guess, the application of, like, I think, I suppose, just, just some like some good technique to kind of elevate them from being, you know, like that, that knowledge of how things work and like what kind of stuff can elevate um, the most simple of things into something that's kind of special. So, yeah, um, there's one of our, tarts that was um based on a, a financier that i used to make in my during my apprenticeship um and then there's say there's another one that that i helped uh, design for to help my friend open a restaurant back in sydney um yeah for a, for the most part they're they're very much just like drawn from my life experiences and they all do have a little bit of a kind of nostalgic uh pull from them you know Oh, it's beautiful. I love it. And mm. Andrea, tell us about the bricks, bricks and mortar you're in now. Because one thing... Yeah. And then, Gareth, you've got big news to share with us as well about, like I mentioned before, but tell us about where you've moved moved into and was that part of the plan when you first started in a kitchen at home last year? Um, I, it was... No, not really. Sorry, I'm okay. saying to Andrea, but you, let's talk. Oh, about sorry, it. pardon me. No, 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 all, not at all, right. because you both had bricks yeah. and mortars to talk about. Yeah, and I was trying to understand who was the question for too. No, to I'm sorry, that was maybe yeah. maybe our line, or oh, I was speaking too quickly. It can. <laughs> so, firstly, Andrea, tell us about where you've moved into, and was that part of your business? And then I want to hear about Cremorne as well. So um, now we are in Carlton, um, one six one Nicholson Street. Yeah. And um, we have uh, an amazing space. I'm looking around right now because I still can't believe we're here. And um, yeah, we have a restaurant side where um, we get our customers every night during normal, normal times. And uh, we get around 50 covers. But we always try to do um, 40 to take care of the people a bit better and don't make it too messy, but more classy and, and fine. Yes. And, um, we also have a left left side where I'm standing right now. And uh, this is our shop, it's called Sapori. Uh, we sell our beautiful uh, pasta. Mm-hmm. Some of it is fresh, some of it is uh, frozen. We like to say freshly frozen <laughs> because uh, uh, actually, um, you know, most of the pastas you buy from supermarkets or, or wherever you go and buy them, they are pretty steamed because they're actually fresh, fresh pasta. Uh, does stick together when it's in a box. So we've been working um, to find the best way to how to deliver it to people and how to move it. And um, yeah, with all the fuel pasta, we blast chill it. And there uh, was also a technique I was using uh, uh, back in Italy in a Mission Star restaurant. So we, yeah, let's say we find this uh, good balance in using um, the same ingredients um, in both the sides. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, we also have an online business where we sell all these beautiful products we uh, been picking and doing our um, uh, working period. And oh. it's all things we like to use and we love to eat. And uh, yeah. And every, every creation we do, um, 
start pretty much the, the season yes. and what the supplier has. So from there, we start the creation. Gotcha. So can I also just um, interrupt for a moment? Everyone who's watching, um, please send through questions for any of these three wonderful people because I know Aud Audrey's working further after our talk tonight and we'll talk about that as well. But um, please send through questions about anything you're wondering about how they operate and what they've done. Because Andrea, just on that, I wonder if, how much have you learned since starting? Oh. I, I can't, I can't I'm, I'm, like, like, being at home yeah. and now you're on a business, the number, the, the, the jumps, the hoops you've had to jump through must be quite extraordinary. Yeah, the, the first things I've been learning, believe it or not, were plastering, demolishing. <laughs> uh, um, Sounds like a great owner. Yeah. <laughs> be, 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 be a bit of a tradie. And uh, yeah, yeah um, that was the first things because I've always been cooking. And, uh, you know, so managing big, big teams uh, uh, of people in the kitchen. So I was kind of used to that. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, needed to call an electrician and, and see big invoices, uh, uh, manage the full money of, uh, a, of a big business like that, because we kind of have a really big business. Uh, I didn't realize it straight away, but now I do. And, and yeah, mm -hmm. those are the parts I've been learning. Gareth, talk about the things you've learned so far and tell us about today. I saw Gareth this morning, everyone, actually at his last day at Worksmith or taking things mm. back to Worksmith. So share, mm. share with us what you can about all that. Uh, um, I, I guess in, in regards to things that I've learned, I mean, I'll, you know, not to, to, to change the tone of the conversation, learn a lot about myself. I didn't really know where I was going to be going um, at the end or before before lo lockdown started. Um, when I when I was out of work, I wasn't sure whether or not I was going to be going back into food again because I, you know, the the experience of having to close a restaurant that you've committed six years of your life to was pretty um, challenging. Um, Just what that restaurant was? Can you talk about that? I was dinner by dinner by Heston. Oh, you were there the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh -huh. um, yeah, I kind of wasn't really sure if I wanted to stick around in, in cooking for much longer. Oh. So, yeah, after that, um, yeah, doing this sort of thing at home really made me kind of fall back in love with with, with food again, um, which was pretty great. Hmm. The time that I spent working um, at Loon Croissant, I think, kind of helped me sort of really channel that into where I saw that going. And um, I guess uh, now that with the momentum we've built with Tarts and On, it's, yeah, it's really helped me define my focus and where I see my goals being in, in the future. So, but then on top of that, yeah, now like being just a, just being in charge of your own business, being in charge of your, of yourself, like the responsibility, the, the difference between working for yourself and, working for someone else and how that feels the, the the satisfaction and the reward you get. And I kind of feel now that like, I don't really, really work anymore when I'm doing this because I just, you know, that's your normal life. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. It's just, yeah. You're constantly like, I mean, that's where your mind is because not only do you want to you know, be successful, you you I guess the, the constant looming threat of like, you know, not being profitable and, is is very real it's not like you can just clock off anymore but um yeah mm. at the same time you don't have to answer anyone as well it's just yeah it's pretty incredible i'll never go back so yeah we haven't got to the bricks and mortar yet but audrey this mm. is a nice thread at the moment audrey tell us about what you've learned about you in the um three months or so. yeah i've learned a lot about myself just like what gareth said um and like how much I can achieve mm. as well. Like I'm very proud of what I've done. Mm. Um, and then the community of Melbourne, everyone, how kind they are. I've learned a lot about them. And even uh, just the streets, like having to do my deliveries, I had no idea where anywhere was. So I'm not from Melbourne. Um, yeah. And that was so daunting. And then now I know where everywhere, everywhere is. Like, I just feel yeah. like this is my home now. Yeah. yeah. Um, We're very happy to have you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um there's still a lot to learn though I mean I still do things really old school mm -hmm. um and I'm not very ones, you would say of your business like one of the things that make it so delicious wouldn't you all do things in a kind of very is it old, old school, school or is it classic and strong technique is it it's classic um when I say old school I kind of mean 
it took me like, I don't have a website or I don't have like, you know, all the technology. I do things by hand a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and I need to improve on that, but, um, I'm still learning. Yeah. We never stop. I think that's part of the mm. yeah. fun bits of life. Never stop learning. Never, ever. I have a question that's come through for you, Gareth. Mm. It's from um, Yalan Gang. So thank you for sending a question. Do you have a marketing person or other people helping you with your photography? <laughs> Gareth? Yep. Yeah, <laughs> Is this yeah a- I do. It's yeah. pretty much all, it's all cat. It's all cat. Yeah. yeah. So Kat um, is your fiance? Yeah, or Ka- Ka- Catherine. Yeah, Catherine. Catherine. She's... Um, well, I mean, I think she puts it best herself when we do, or like one of the things that she's said a couple of times on um, as part of our social media is that when people ask about us or, you know, we want to share a little bit about who we are, it's always Gareth does the baking and Kat does all the everything else, which is pretty much the truth. Um, she's, yeah, she's, a, she's an amateur photographer and she's like incredible at it. Um, she's obviously quite quick witted and you know she's got a she's got a bit of a bit of a, a zingy tongue so to speak she's yeah she's so um yeah so she's the one who's coming up with all that kind of kind of banter on the instagram page all the promotion oh, yes, um, suggest- said you're very lucky which i think is a lovely thing to say. i'm incredibly lucky honestly it's uh i, I don't I I, if it was me if it was me okay. just looking after it i'd be like just you know <laughs> come and get a tart I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've made these. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> get them. That's great. Yeah, couldn't do it. But yeah, so she's she's definitely the brains if if we want to go down that path and I'm the brawn. That's beautiful. I have a question for you, Audrey, from Georgia. Oh, how did you start getting word out if you don't have a website? Um, um I do, just to finish, have both your businesses has, has your business grown organically or just through social media? Or- it's, oh. Yeah, just grown through social media. Mm-hmm. Um, I decided to start Holy Sugar a week before I started delivering and having pickup. Um, so I made like a label, a logo, everything, took a photo of the box, um, all a few days, like made a, a business account and whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, Okay. When you say make a business account, do you mean you registered your business? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some people yeah, might be, cool. and I'm not. I'm just sort of. If you can clarify that, because there are all those the legal the legal stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's a lot of things you've got to do, even for okay. somewhere that you don't have bricks and mortar. Can you? What were the things you registered the business and? Yeah, I mean, like I've got the square reader for yeah. top and go. Obviously, COVID, you have to be safe. Um, what else did I do? Uh, insurance yeah everything just within a week um I kind of I forget the question it was about how did you start getting word out oh yeah for Instagram I literally had I think I had a thousand followers on my personal account and it was mainly for people in New South Wales where I'm from and word just spread I said I think um I did a shout out the first week and I said um someone gets a free box if you share my post and yeah, I don't know. I just I had like 17 orders on a Saturday and then 25 on the Sunday. And for me, like day one, that was that was enough. Like it, it was just a side thing for me. So I wasn't looking for anything too crazy. And then week after week, I just got busier and busier. People shared, you know, their to their stories and all their friends started following and it just grew like that. Yeah, I didn't, I haven't paid for anything. I haven't, I've given, I think, you know, two people some free stuff. Yeah. Um, since I've started, which is um, my old um, head chef at Point Leo, Phil Wood, um, and Pat Nurse, and that's that's it. Um, and that was more of a respect thing. I just really liked them. I didn't expect anything in return. It's just grown, yeah, organically, I guess. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. But there must be a consistency to your messaging, and maybe that's just quite literally just your. your what's on offer every week maybe it's yeah that. yeah maybe I um yeah that could be it as well I don't know yeah no I just I find the social media part because that's the three of you have started that way as well Andre talk can you tell us how you got the word out initially oh so um at the start I was just going a bit old-fashioned I was uh giving uh, flies on the street I remember really? I was uh, yeah I was prepping from uh, nine o'clock 
uh, yeah. in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning until 5 p.m. And after I was giving flyers. And uh, I've been lucky. Uh, I think I gave it randomly on the street in Fitzroy to someone of the age. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, they did an article uh, of my food. Yes. And, um, and uh, yeah, the, day, the, the week after I was uh, in the pub uh, doing around 15 brands of sales. Yeah. yeah. 15, 15 orders from a week from one no, hour. $50,000 of sales. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's good. Wow. In a, in a week or yeah. so. And also. Uh, well, I was lucky. So, all of this and the fact we are in this place and uh, it's not me, you know, it's, uh, I always be, always be lucky because of the team supporting me. First thing now, um, uh, my business partner, Davide, and uh, we are in together every day. Mm -hmm. uh, we manage the kitchen together, uh, pick dishes, uh, work on uh, menus, wine and uh, logistics and all of that. And mm -hmm. also my partner, Michelle, which is, uh, yeah, me and David always say without Michelle, we'd probably still be there trying to send the first email. Um, mm -hmm. if I'm, and, I'm uh, not trying to sound sexist here, but the support of a good woman never goes astray. And you know, I'm just saying that. The two of you are good examples yeah. of that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so she, she's amazing. And, and uh, yeah, all of the team, you know, I, I started just myself, but I've been lucky to have the right people on board. And uh, without the right people, we want to be able to do what we're doing now. So, yeah. That's, I find um, in any kind of environment, whether you work alone or with your network, even just Gareth, if I may come to you and say, there's you and Catherine, sure, at the core. Mm. But I imagine, do you, have you turned to people for mentorship or um, created a community around the business that helps you grow and get perspective from others? So, I know, so, really. I think I think for me it was. I mean, we've we've had we've had the support of the community 100. percent Like that's been that's been the very core of our business. I think this whole time, and I think these guys can both attest to that. Like, it started off, I think, um, with with the um, the community wanting to do the sort of the right thing and support people who've been, you know, who who are trying to make a go of a crap situation, mm -hmm. um, which I know um, all three of us have. So I'm not saying it was pity, but there was definitely an element of um, people thinking like, oh, you know, let's, let's see if we can help someone out, like support a small business and, you know, hopefully we'll get something good out of the end. And then eventually this kind of, it did all very much organically grow. Yeah. But I think social media is a big catalyst of that. And did you start like... Audrey and like Andrea in terms you just started talking about it and sharing it with oh, it's just um it was just like yeah in our in our little one bedroom two bedroom apartment in, in Richmond um had an oven that could fit one tart at a time so that was a nightmare. We then dropped the little flyers into some of our because it was just the idea was doing it in people in our like in our building. There's a couple of hundred apartments in, in this block. So dropped some little flyers into their letterboxes with the intention of just, you know, maybe rocking a little cart down there and handing them out to people who could meet us from their respective apartments. But um, yeah, it just kind of kicked off. Um, and there's a little sort of community within like a 1K radius. It just sort of started getting into it. We got one popular, very famous um, customer once, and then that just kickstarted it and that went nuts. That's when it really took off. Yeah. Right. So we're very lucky. Yeah. Oh, it's one. And as we've said this morning, the harder you work, the luckier you get too. I yeah, think. exactly. I think you create a lot of that energy around yourself. I have. Mm. So there is a question for you, Audrey, that you may have touched on. Do you, did you need to register your kitchen? And how did you go about starting a food biz? So if you wanted to, and Audrey does work from a commercial kitchen in Worksmith because it mentions was at home. But yeah, how did you go about registering the business and starting it? Um, well, I was just working out of home for the first two months. And then after that, I started to get, you know, customers I hadn't met before. I didn't know who they were. So that's when I started to go to Worksmith and get the commercial kitchen. Okay, great. And I have a question for the three of you from Nick Lewis. So thank you, Nick. He's interested to know what the most challenging parts of your respective businesses are. Thank you, Nick. That was on my list of questions. Is it finding new customers, managing orders, doing deliveries? What's the hardest bit? Um, Gareth, if you can go first. Um, well, yeah, I, 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 
don't know, this, this might come across a bit conceited. We've, we've, I've just been so lucky. The hardest thing for me is trying to just um, to make the most of it. And at the moment, I haven't really been doing that. Um, but yeah, that's very much a part of our future. Like, you know, I feel we let, like we, we're, we're selling out, we get a lot of demands. And because I've been dividing my time between this and, and, a, and a job, it's been tricky to mm. kind of, you know, deliver more of that. So that's been hard, has been balancing it with other aspects of my life. Um, but yeah, that's, that. I guess I'm going to fe- make, face a whole bunch of new challenges, yeah, soon enough. Yes. Can you, are you, can you elaborate more on that? We have uh, yeah, yeah. So we're, we are, we're, as, as we've mentioned before, moving out of the worksmith kitchen, yeah. um, you know, and it has very much served its purpose in that like it's the most perfect launch pad for people's hospitality businesses. And, you know, um, we couldn't have done that with the guys at worksmith. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we managed to uh, find a, a location, which was originally just supposed to be um like another commercial kitchen where we can try and generate some a bit more product because um as audrey mentioned she's got the she's got the money maker um uh, friday <laughs> saturday on fight night and um yeah and we felt like you know we could probably just we could almost double production if we just had um had had those days of the week where we can just reach our audience a bit better yeah. uh so we found a space but then turns out the space that we're looking at also had a retail element attached and we had a couple of conversations with some um <clears throat> with some people uh and uh have now just kind of taken this blind leap of faith into into opening a, a shop yeah which is going to be happening in the next month or so which is yeah. very exciting will it have I'm excited um season yeah. uh there's going to be some like a small amount of standing room Mm-hmm. Uh, there'll also be we're going to have some stools in there um, and there's going to be a little bit of seating on the street but it's going to be very much there won't be tables and chairs as such it'll be more of like just a little bit of bench space for people to have a bit of tart and coffee to dine in yeah. Um, yeah so we're going to try and generate a lot of traffic through that but we would still heavily rely on our takeaway model in that people can come in and take a piece away or they can pre-order um, their quarter halves and holes and, you know, do away with um, yeah with that as they will. And we're going to have a couple of different offerings as well. So there's be a few different flavors available for both pickup and pre-order. Um, yeah, just but just tarts. It's just going to be a tart, tart only experience. Yeah, I think that's it's fun. it's cool. Is that? It's actually a question I'll follow on with. But first, Andreas, what? To answer that question for Nick, the biggest challenges that you've had? Oh, uh, probably the biggest challenge for me is a uh, clock off. Uh, it's always been like arrive to a moment where I say, okay, let's see, mm-hmm. this is enough and just take some time to rest because uh, for, for, for when I started, probably that's been definitely the biggest challenge. Um, switch but- off. Is switch that- off yeah, yeah. definitely Sorry, stay, stay 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 calm and switch off at a daily challenge yeah yeah um but in, in the same time uh it's also like that i reckon because we've been lucky like from when we opened the restaurant with the liquor license uh we have been fully booked uh every day we were open mm-hmm. and um you know there's a lot of opportunity to do great things so my head is always rolling and thinking and, and we was trying to um improve get better and everything is happening fast. So um, mm-hmm. it's a, I'll always feel like the duty to, to uh, need to be there and take the right choice and be present and work hard for it because I feel like I had an opportunity not many people had. So um, yeah, probably the biggest challenge is, uh, you know, slow down a second and, and be like, okay, mm-hmm. um, that, that's the biggest challenge. And by the way, I want to say, I'm really excited to walk in in the shop soon and just buy one of your thoughts. No, I know, I can't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, I, I can't so wait. good that, to be able to offer in. that. Yeah. yeah, I have a question that'll be, that'll be great. about bricks and mortar here from Ed. Thanks, Ed, for getting in touch. It's so Gareth to you first. How mm. did you know it was the right time to move to bricks and mortar? If you don't mind saying, did you seek investment? Is the question. You don't have to answer that if you don't want to. Uh, no, no was... we didn't seek investment. Okay. How was no. it? T- how did you know it was time for bricks and mortar? 
Well, as I said, it was pretty organic. Like we kind of, we, like, uh, we were just looking to kind of, to expand um, like our production without having to, um, you know, change too much to our daily lives. Like, I was, yeah. My intention was to continue working, to be honest, just, but we're just to shift my, um, my days of the week to be more focused on the weekend to, to, you know, generate that, um, yeah, that revenue for our business. That's all it was. Um, and then it's one of those pinch yourself moments when something like that does come up. You think this is almost too good to be true, but then, yeah, if we go down that same mantra of, of creating your own luck, I think if you sort of persevere and hopefully make those right choices, then, then that luck generally pays for itself. So yeah, it was, I think, um, we were always uh, anticipating within the next year or so we'd go into that. Mm-hmm. Um, but so then it was when this something that you were thinking about, yeah, hundred um, percent. I think I made the decision uh, earlier this year that um, my future was going to be, and like immediate future was going to be, uh, being my own boss full time and opening. Uh, an an establishment of my own and trying to expand that over a few years into having a couple of different places where I can you know be be proud of you know what I'm what it is I'm I'm offering to the public but then yeah this just again it's like you got to take those opportunities when they come up and um, I think with the amount of traction that we had at the time yeah it was a bit of it'd be you'd be stupid not to so yeah I think it always kind of felt right. What about you, Andrea? Almost over did you, did, well done. did you know, Andrea, that it was time for bricks and mortar? Like, how did to answer Ed's question? How did you know it was the right time? Oh, it just um, you know how I was saying before uh, when we started having so much requests, I kind of felt the duty to keep going. Yeah. And uh, I remember the, the the first time um, we closed, I was still actually like employed in another like restaurant i was still working for grossi oh. and uh, the fir- the first time we closed we received like uh, thousands of emails of people saying we are so sad we did record of sales in in, in one day we empty all the fridges and freezers and uh, i was just like i can't leave it like that mm-hmm. just uh, so we needed to yeah um the time. Uh, I, well, it was just time, you know. Uh, it never, and we never stopped. We never really even decided. We didn't have a chart and say, "Okay, we are doing it for tomorrow." It just been a, a roller coaster, no stop. Um, yeah, and here we are. Hey, Audrey, what about you and bricks and mortar? What's your relationship like with that? I know you don't want to. You're not ready to work with someone else yet, and I'm not saying you have to do it. Is it something that you might not ever do? Um. Yeah, I think it's something I might not ever do. Um, I think that I've always got to put my mental health first. And I honestly think that could possibly push me over the edge. Um, that's that's an intense answer. If you don't, can I yeah. ask a little bit about that? Like, as in, you obviously know yourself well enough to know yeah. this is where this is where my boundaries are. And when yeah. you said before about knowing when to say no, can we, you expand a little bit on, on those elements of you? Um, I think I'm a bit of a people pleaser. And I'm probably a bit of a pushover. So um, I've got to be careful with how much I commit to. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that if I was to be doing something like that, it would probably drive me crazy because I would just be so like frantic about having it so perfect. And, you know, I have to be in there every day. And I just don't think that I would um, cope very well with the pressure. Um, So what I'm doing now is perfect for me, you know, like, it's the, it's the one day it's, it's huge. You know, it takes a lot of prep and, um, an effort. Um, I don't really have days off to be honest anymore, mm-hmm. um, which is fine. I love it. Um, but I think this is, this is probably my limit. I'll probably end up taking a lot more orders. I might do, you know, events or, you know, something like pop-up things mm-hmm. might even be doing classes maybe that'd be really fun to like special classes for people but I don't think that I would have a shop um yeah about switching off I think what Andrea was saying and also just yeah that commitment levels yeah do you think 
and because I know I realized the time and we've you know maybe got another five to ten left but do you think that you have more options in food businesses can be different things now it's when you said before Gareth Mm. I can just have a shop that just sells tarts and they're the tarts I want to sell and the best they can be and or you can you can have cooking classes and events and do what you do and Andrea you can open this these doors and serve everything on your terms and how you want to do it now there are elements of that that were always what a restaurant was but is it different now after lockdown have you got a bit more Um, freedom in an ironic kind of way Gareth what do you think um yeah I think so I think the lockdowns really changed the way that people well it's really I mean don't be wrong there's this there is a certain element of people missing the experience of going to a restaurant Mm. um but I feel like the way that people have approached uh, and embraced these sort of micro businesses such as ours um I mean, for me, I, I personally have changed the way like, I miss the pub. Like I miss the pub a lot, Ooh. but um, you know, I'm not going to be racing out to go to um, fine dining restaurants any soon, anytime soon, even when restrictions are fully lifted. I, um, I, I love the freedom that like, um, you know, businesses like Andreas has, has given us, you know what I mean? We can eat like this world-class level food uh, at home. Um, you know, you can you can have you know world class pastries delivered to your door, which was something that really wasn't much of a an idea prior to this. Um, and I think in in other senses, like you could just take things away and go and eat in a in a um, in a in a in a park or a garden, and that's kind of I guess it was a really new, it's a really new concept. Yeah, there's a yeah. new concept for people uh, to a certain degree. Like it's not as if it was it was it wasn't possible, but like the fact that it's become so normalized, I think people are, are really embracing it and that's changed a lot. So hopefully no one, um, you know, misses out once we do find the new normal and fine dining restaurants end up just like hitting the skids because no one wants to go there anymore. But um, yeah. yeah, I think it's definitely had a bit of a shift. What about you, Andrea? What do you think in terms of, I? because I, I agree, I think could... Andrea, can you open a restaurant these days without having a variety of offerings in terms of a retail shop as you have, a dining room, a takeaway outlet, like very defined areas under um, one umbrella? Yeah, so um, like me, David was just walked in now. And David, you want to come and say hi? Come and say hi quickly. Anyway, he's uh, a bit shy. Um, uh, Me and David always, uh, um, yeah, spoke about that and... We were like, um, you know, our idea of restaurant was really different at the start. You, we like fine dining. We want to give a, a, an experience to customers regarding the food and, and the and numerous amount of dishes. And, um, but we looked also in the situation where we are and uh, uh, we realized the luck we had for what we started doing, which was actually, you know, uh, Tagliatelle delivered the home. So um, we had the great idea to combine the two things and um, I just feel like it's an amazing um, response and, and just works well. And now we, we use the same imagination we were using one day for a dish in the restaurant, mm-hmm. also in the delivery, also in the, in the shop. Uh, uh, for example, this week you can build um, at home uh, um, a lamb with um, uh, fregola and you have uh, spaghetti with bugs and uh, you build your Wagyu Berzaola with instruction like the restaurant and uh, everything is uh, delivered separately so i just feel like yeah it's a great idea to have a shop and use different ways to deliver food at the moment because uh, the situation where we are is open closing and yeah we never we never stop we never stop we just push on a different direction when the restaurant is open we do dining in and then when we are in lockdown we deliver mm-hmm. uh, that's a luck for us wonderful audrey tell us what would you what advice would you give someone wanting to either do something like you do as in very like individual on your own terms um how um i think you can have within you and how do you look after yourself within that too um if you want to start something don't think about it just do it Mm -hmm. don't talk about it just do it it's so easy and you just have to kind of separate you know do a little bit of a 
mind out of body experience and just get on with it. And it's not that scary. Um, but what scares you about it, if I may ask? It's a, uh, I think maybe failing. Yeah. Is a big thing. I think people don't want to start something because they're worried about failing, but just whatever, just give it a go. <laughs> that that right. keeps you up though. Yeah. yeah. How do you look after yourself and switch off? When you can. I know you said you work every day and it's in your mind and it's really hard. A lot of people we know work for themselves. Yeah. I think I'm very lucky where I live. I've got five other girls who are my best friends that I live with. So oh. when I come home, I just vent and I talk to them and I just, it's very safe space. I think that's just how I switch off. It's very easy for me to do that with them. Yep. Um, and yeah, I guess saying no, you know, giving myself that respect of saying, you know, I can't do this for you and that I'm having a day off this day or whatever. I'm doing less boxes this week because I have to do this, you know, that helps me switch off. But And that's very, that's great because if you actually need an entire week off, you could just put up a, put up something on Instagram, turn everything off for a few days, theoretically, couldn't yeah, you? I could. I have in the past, you know, I've said um, next week I won't, won't be doing a box. And I let people know that. And I've, you know, gone for a, a holiday in Taradale or whatever. Um, yep. And that's, I, I need that every, every now and then. And people aren't going to die if they don't have cake. They'll still live. Um, and you have to put yourself first because, you know, if, yeah. if you're a mess in the kitchen, if Gareth walks in and I'm on the floor crying, you know, it's no, it helps no one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, beautiful. And just quickly, Gareth and Andrea, two things that you might do for yourself to keep you. If it is, is it bike riding or running or bike, yeah, all right. cry on the kitchen floor? I'm joking, Audrey. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, yeah. we've all, let's normalize it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Gareth, what do you do? Uh, yeah, I ride my bike. I ride a bike. Um, yeah, as much as I can. Um, helps me clear my head, helps, you know, make me feel a bit better about myself, keeps me healthy. Yeah. Um, yeah um and yeah it's pretty much it i've i think I've, I've i have reached a point in my life where i have learned uh when to switch off um i i i think i don't i don't think that makes <laughs> makes it any, it makes it an easy thing to do because it really isn't and especially when you're doing it for yourself mm. you know that like every opportunity where you have where you're not on is potentially an opportunity missed to improve yeah. yourself, improve your business, you know, and let's not, you know, bit around the bush, make some money. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it is, it is, it is kind of a, a thing that yeah, is a motivator. Um, Gosh, that's a whole other episode. Yeah. What, you know, those moments of switching off how you even have to let go of what you might be losing because you're actually gaining something for yourself. But yeah. It's, it is, it is something that I think Audrey, touched on as well was like you got to learn to like you know put yourself first and yeah you don't want to be a slave to the almighty dollar but um yeah you need there is there's all about it's all about finding that balance and i feel that i've been put through the ringer a few times to know where that threshold is for me yes. so yeah i try and put my focus into you know spending time with my partner I'm very lucky that i get to work with her as well so there's not as much pressure to do that as perhaps other people, um, but yeah, ride my bike. Beautiful. Hang out, hang out with my idiot dog. Yeah. <laughs> we love dogs. That's beautiful. Yeah. Andrea, what do you do? Are you a runner or a cyclist? Or? Well, I, I used to run. Now I can't really run anymore. But we go for long walks. Me and Michelle, my partner, um, one day a week, which is great. Uh, sometimes I just like to come to work uh, with my electronic skateboard. That gives me. Um, I just get the long street and, and keep riding. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, but probably the thing which I love more and use for distract myself and have fun and relax is try the food of other people. This is what makes me feel mm. better. Because for yeah. once, I'm the one which is not thinking what to do, but is receiving. And uh, it's something I really love. Like, for example, doing lockdown too, there's amazing mm. um, restaurants which they're doing delivery and um, also build your... Uh, dinner at home and that for me is the best fun 
that's a beautiful way to wrap this up actually because we all need to try beautiful food from the three of your businesses actually as well yeah. as thank you and say thank you to all of you for your generous generous insights and time tonight audrey you've got to go back and fix up orders right you've just yeah wrapping up tonight do you want to quickly give us a plug and then we'll say good night so holy sugar where do we find you on Instagram, it's holy sugar with two underscores. Okay. Gareth, where do we find uh, you? So we are Tarts Anon, so Tarts underscore Anon on Instagram. Uh, we also got our website, uh, tartsanon.com.au, um, and at a soon to be disclosed address. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully in a couple of weeks, you can come and find us down in Cremorne. Stay tuned, everyone. Yeah. Congratulations again. Yeah, thank you very much. Dale, where do we find you? Uh, you guys can find us on uh, Instagram, on Facebook, on our beautiful website, Aldente Noteca, and here in Nicholson Street. Mm, beautiful. Guys, on behalf of Worksmith and Turnip, and also um, thank you to our partners, Square, Zero, ALM, and Mercedes Benz Vans. Sorry, I got tongue tied. And also Kookaburra. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Gareth. And thank you, Andrea, for being part of our second Worksmith Community Series Talks. I'm Hilary McNevin, and I will see you next month. And guys, thank you. Really, really generous and really inspiring. And just keep thank going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Just too thank beautiful. Thank you. It's been great to be here. <laughs> thank you. Stay well, everyone. <laughs>